working within. And I'd seen the film being spanned late. Uh, and I thought, I could, this, this, they're going to speak to each other. I'm going to use this film to try and help me work through these ideas. Um, so, shall I go for my next? It's in four sections. The, the last section is very short, so you get a sense of the time. So the paper, Animal Melancholia on the Scent of Dean Spanley, explores the prescription of what I call an animal cure in this beguiling film adaptation of Lord Dunstan's 1936 novella called Dean Spanley, which is directed by Terrell Fraser. The film does not self-consciously extend itself to support an ethics that would include animals. Indeed, it comes close to the problems that we might readily associate with fables, in which animals figure uh, habitually only as ciphers for human beings. However, as I hope to show, close reading allows for some productive leeway in the relations it, provokes, it proposes, the questions it provokes. The animal cure in this film is not for a sick animal, or animals in general, if there were such a thing. Rather, Dean Spanley enacts a cure for the melancholia, uh, for melancholia as manifested in a cantankerous elderly man. Fisk. <laughs> uh, Fisk, a cantankerous not... elderly man. He's not elderly. No. What's your name? Thank you very much. Fisk, <laughs> played by Peter O'Toole, which actually was the other reason I wanted to, to write about the film, because I was completely in love with Peter O'Toole and still am. Um, so Fisk, this elderly, cantankerous, melancholic man, Fisk's extremely formal relationship with his surviving son, Henslow, is stimmied by the unmourned deaths of his other son, Harrington, and his wife, unnamed. Meanwhile, Henslow, played by uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Northam in The Hat, uh, becomes fascinated with the oddly convincing stories produced by the local clergyman, the eponymous Dean, played by uh, Sam Neill, of his life as a dog, when enjoying the scent of the rare Hungarian liquor, Tokai. Realizing that the dog, in whose name the Dean speaks, uncannily recalls the lost pet of his father's childhood, Henslow affects his animal cure through the means of a dinner party. From the moment that this pet, named Wag, is returned through the medium of the Dean's apparent recollection, Fisk can begin to cry and thus admit grief. Yet from this moment too, the intoxication with Dean Spanley fades. The resolution of the last scene proposes a happy Fisk, see him here, accompanied by a new pet dog. Dean Spanley makes a series of doubles between humans and dogs, son and dog, Harrington and Wag, dog and father in the Dean and also in Fisk, and also of dog friends and human friends, Wag's doggy friend and rather the conveyancer, uh, who's up there on the end, uh, played by Brian Brown, uh, and who is narratively uh, Henslow's fellow conspirator in the supply of Tokai. It's able to do this with the key scenes of the film too. Humans assembled around a dining table, so, uh, rhymed with dogs running through fields. Um, in convening the entwined narratives through a ritual meal, metonymized by this drink, Tokai, Dean Spanley invites reflections on the primal feast and the legend of consanguinity of the same blood, the legend of consanguinity between human clan and totem animal as invoked in Freud's well-known Totem and Taboo. Ostensibly telling a tale of reincarnation, and one that is persuasively evoked through the cinematic convention of flashback, the film enables discussion regarding mourning among humans and animals, specifically the dog as man's best friend. The paper explores these interwoven themes in light of Derrida's investigations into the work of mourning, as related to this ethical project that he names Eating Well,
really know how to make my embedded film appear. Oh, I've heard it said remarkable events often. I just wanted to show you because I mean, there is a. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that my kind of storytelling voice will mind the kind of storytelling of the film. So assuming that nobody apart from Henry and Johnny have seen the film, but nevertheless will kind of will kind of be there in spirit. But I'll just show you the film trailer, which in the way of film trailers these days shows the entire film in. Can you make it full screen? I can make it full screen. And have ordinary beginnings. Never was this more true than on my Thursday. Very handy a Thursday keeps Wednesday and Friday from colliding. <laughs> my father is not an easy man. Great, great pleasure, sir. Originally pleased is all I can say. He dislikes many things. <laughs> Children, for instance. <laughs> what on earth possessed you to do such a thing? Especially in his own. What's on? And he dislikes Dean Spanley. Brown chaps, family, not quite sound. Because he reminds him. Think if they had souls, they wouldn't get in touch, of course they would. Of where his life is going. So he doesn't read the pictures because he's afraid he'll come across his own name. <laughs> <laughs> but this Thursday would be different. Let us drink to the inevitable. <sighs> you only inhaled it. He was transported this other place to the road master and dark what is this fellow on about this is in his mind and sit the collar and then I'd sit down and have a little scratch and barking manually I don't want to be a dog and not have fleas do you believe the incarnation or be caught uh, I see you talk to you about it. Don't tell me I don't believe in enough things already. What happened? I cannot fully explain. My moment you are running along, and the next you are no more. Must we get too set in our ways? Remarkable events often have ordinary beginnings. Never was this more true than of my talks with Dean Spanley. I should be pleased now to answer any questions. <clears throat> Where am I? You are, my dear sir, in the ante room of eternity. Totem and Tokai. Most of the proliferating commentaries on Derrida's posthumously published book, The Animal That Therefore I Am, concentrate on Derrida's encounter with the animal in or as his deconstruction of the persistent philosophical support for human exceptionalism. Yet observant readers would have noticed that in reference to his own zoo-autobiography, so animals, ears, lives, writing, 
Um, Derrida remarks that his writings have welcomed, his word, animal differences on the threshold of sexual differences. The word welcome draws attention to an ethics of hospitality to the other, rather than a man manifesto of rights. Derrida's transfigured autobiographical texts welcome sexual and animal others. While this kind of welcome includes the complication of being hostage and not simply host to unknown others, Derrida nevertheless offers a scene of hospitality that moves away from canonical, autobiographical, and philosophical negation or abjection of those others in the name of the subject that calls itself man. The scenes of hospitality that structure this film, however, echo these problematic processes of negation or abjection, not least in regard to the primal feast that Freud deduces must have occurred at the origin of culture. For Freud, this feast is a ritualized, exceptional event that permits the clans of primitive cultures to kill and to eat their totem, a specific animal with whom they assume a consanguinous relation, the truth of sexual reproduction being unknown. Without this ritual, such a meal would have been strictly taboo, murderous and cannibalistic. As codified a momentous event, the ritual both, both breaks the law and founds it. Interleaving numerous anthropological sources, Freud works in the present of his clinical observation of animal phobias. His phobics exhibit ambivalence, love and hate, towards the feared animal and Freud finds continuity between primitive and modern cultures in support of the theory of psychoanalysis. I quote, it was the same in every case where the children examined were boys, their fear related at bottom to their father and had merely been displaced onto the animal. Regardless of any doubt raised by the absent question of girls, the primal meal requires greater finesse and Freud further entrenches the father at the origin of culture by supplying a revised wish for which the primal feast is already a dilution. Consanguinity, the fantasy of being of the same blood, is of no consequence. Our animal ancestry is a displacement of patriarchy, literally the father at the origin. Freely borrowing from Darwin, Freud imagines the overcoming of the primal father by the company of brothers, who murder and eat him. Such is the enormity of their guilt that the father is resurrected in name and as law without even having to die, since the wish to so dispatch him would have been forced enough for psychic reality. As feminist scholars such as Kelly Oliver have remarked, Totem and Taboo glosses over both modes of kinship that predate the nuclear family as well as the scattered, incoherent references to feminine fancies and maternal deities in the rush to render the father original, necessary, human. Retaining the notion that affective response to criminal events founds culture as law, Kristeva uh, invokes not only the murder and cannibalism of the father, but also incest with the mother. Most of the literature following Derrida on the question of the animal has remained within his philosophical terrain, targeting the Cartesian legacy of such as Heidegger, Levinas, Lacan. Yet Kelly Oliver has shown that female thinkers such as Kristeva also demand to be rethought in light of the human exceptionalism that they too legislate. Thus I introduce her with caution. In Kristeva's case, alongside the human and masculine route to language, the abject haunting of, the, of any border recalls not only the body of the mother through our own personal archeology, span but also on a wider scale, animality, expelled as, quote, representatives of sex and murder, end quote, or lawlessness. Indeed, animal and sexual differences traverse the same horizon. Kristeva might address Freud's notorious blind spot regarding femininity, but she does not offer a feminist counter model as she acknowledges. The uncertainties of Kristeva's mother offer no solace to the subject. Moreover, Kristeva endorses the requirement that the social rest upon the exchange of women between men, indexing the symbolic exchange of signs, for fear of the untutored lawlessness of the mother. While the figure of the mother is not 
immediately in evidence in the homosociality of Dean Spanley, the liminal nature of abjection means that her direct representation is not the issue. Given the encoding of the scene of the meal as both paternal and fraternal in Freud and in Dean Spanley, Christeva provides a useful supplement through her attention to the abject power of particular substances. Signally, in Powers of Horror, food as the natural opposes the sociality of man, while food as oral object recalls the archaic relations between human and mother and slash other. Food she reminds us, can always defile. So having set the table with the spectres of cannibalism and incest, I want to turn to Dean Spanley. Thursdays, name a dry ritual between older and younger man, between Fisk and young Fisk, as Henslow is schematically addressed by his father. So young Fisk arrives at his father's house and they address matters of fact, untouched by affective involvement. Henslow himself ironically refers to their scheduled meetings as rituals, and ones he wishes were dismantled. An altogether more fascinating ritual transpires for Henslow with the Dean. Underlining displacement of father for father with capital F, Henslow arranges his meetings with the Dean on Thursdays. Not unaware of this substitution, Fisk makes his own. When they do manage to get together for a Thursday out, Fisk pointedly trips up a young boy. That's all. At first, procuring the Dean's favorite liquor is simply to facilitate their meeting and to allow for the Dean to expand, expound upon the unlikely topic of reincarnation, one Fisk characteristically dismisses as poppycock. Almost immediately, the Dean is implicated in that very topic, as his unusual degree of pleasure in hailing Tokai, the script positions him as entirely focused in the nose, leads him to wish for the olfactory powers of the canine. More disconcertingly, as he continues with increasingly outré remarks, his first person becomes uncannily canine. He does not mimetically sound canine, Rather, his sudden interest in cats, smells, and the love of a master evoke the point of view of a pet dog. At this early stage in Henslow's intoxication with the Dean, no images flesh out his narration as flashback in the manner cinema habitually treats evidentially as memory. We have to take his word for it. The clue to the change in perspective comes through an unusual comparison. The Dean opines that to pull a dog away from a lamppost is akin to seizing a scholar in the British Museum by the scruff of the neck and dragging him away from his studies. Making kin of the inhalation of urine and the study of books threatens the clean and proper body. Inhalation of urine is not named as such, but the comparison follows swiftly on. Uh, Dog and human scholar are made of the same stuff, up to the same activity. Traces of urine are read by a dog like writing is read by a scholar. By implication, to urinate is to write, to leave a trace, one vulnerable to erasure, to smell is to read. Metaphor assumes that the meaning of the term of comparison anchors that to which it is compared. Here, however, the scholar is already dog-like, seized by the scruff of his neck. Later in the climactic sequence, um, which I will uh, later show, it is Fisk that makes a similar comparison in which his wife calls him away from reading Balzac. Quote, rather like dragging a dog away from a lamppost. In both cases, there is no mention of the word urination, which is tidily metonymized by the lamppost. Even as metonymy, the relation based on proximity, the abject contact between urine and study is finessed. In the latter scene, the dean describes the pleasures of eating a whole rabbit, fur, bones, guts, and all, waxing lyrical about the smell of fear. Although by then we are regularly treated to visual flashbacks of Dean Spanley in the guise of Wag the Spaniel, Learning about the world from his roguish, mongrel friend clearly meant to be uh, rather the conveyancer. This visceral desire is overheard by Mrs. Brimley, the housekeeper. 
literally peripheral to the proceedings, her mortification is presented, presented as comedy. She hears something she could not and cannot understand, unaware she is listening to the Dean as a dog. Dean Spanley, the film, is at pains to make sure that our guts are never turned. We, audience, metonymically join with the enraptured homosocial circle of Henslow, Fisk, and Rabba. While Mrs. Brimley has prepared the food and insisted on preparing something more special than the hot pot to which Fisk habitually constrains her, this is not the meal at stake for the assembled men. Though they eschew the tradition of leaving the table in order to enjoy port in separation from any ladies that might ordinarily be present to remain at the table, confirms which meal is in focus. They partake of the story of downing an entire rabbit, mediated by the aroma of Takai, in order to share in the memories voiced by the Dean. Unable to be seen, smell is elusive. It lends itself to the uncanny tale of Dean Spanley, posing the unfathomable question of whether the father was once a dog, while the domestication of that dog points back to Fisk, again containing the impure legend of consanguinity. The film supplements smells invisibility with the Dean's rhetorically exaggerated appreciation of the Takai. This rhetorical exaggeration is given clearest visual expression in the climactic dinner sequence. There, in close-up, the Dean raises his glass to his nose, reminiscing about the delicious smell of fear, the classical soundtrack swells, and the film cuts to the comedically rapid appearance of sheep being chased over the hill by dogs delirious with olfaction. Becoming virtually airborne in their haste, the white clouds of leaping sheep evoke their own scent. In his discussion of smell and Freud, Akira Lippitt refers to its paucity of visible trace as an immateriality that bars smell from forming a semiotic system. In this view, a scent could never form a sentence. In view of current work on new materialisms, however, we might not be so quick to assume that A, smell is immaterial, or B, materiality guarantees signification. <coughs> Tokai is elusive. Rather, the conveyancer sniffs it out. Quite a picture of sniffing food at the table. Dogs. The Kai is elusive. Rather, the conveyancer sniffs it out, squirreled away in the wine cellars of the wealthy though he soon dispenses with a finder's fee for the sake of a place at the table with the dean. It is not disgusting. Even if Tokai is a little syrupy, it is not presented as abject. One does not even have to bother the mouth by drinking it. Tokai is taken by nose. Intoxication with Tokai is not coarse inebriation. This rarefied liquor is claimed as ostentatious, ostentatiously cultural. Rather than confirm human desire over animal need, the Dean imagines that a dog might appreciate its aroma all the more. Perhaps the ritualized exceptional consumption, the elevated palate required to appreciate Tokai protests too much and defends against the possibility that pollution inheres in food. For Henslow and Rabba, this liquor is instrumentally the vehicle for the Dean's transport. Fisk blunts the allure of the Takai, not by emphasizing disgust, but by dismissing it as nothing more than fermented grapes. Outright disgust would too easily register the psychoanalytic mode of repression. Freud famously narrates, albeit in a footnote, itself banished to the bottom of the page, the vertical elevation of man as coterminous with the predominance of the sense of sight, with both verticality and visuality set against the horizontal and olfactory order of the animal. Closer to the earth, closer to the sexual and excretory organs of other four-legged animals, this plane is one foregrounding the sense of smell. Defending against the disgusting smell, then bespeaks the desire for the sexuality it indexes. 
The Dean's elevation of Takai might be read in this context, especially given the homosociality the dinners also convene, eliminating women and cultivating men and male dogs. Yet for Fisk, Takai occupies no extreme. It is neither disgusting nor wondrous. In common with his reduction of Mrs. Brimley's culinary repertoire to the economically descriptive hot pot, and his curt redu reduction of things that have gone to the trouble of happening, including the deaths of his wife and son, as inevitable, Fisk dampens social engagement until he recognizes his dog in the Dean. I will come to this quotation eventually. I don't just leave it up there. Sounding difficult, I do Okay. Section two, sense and sentences. She's headed up by um, this quotation from Derrida, which I'll come to. So, so far, we have a mounting sense of the sociality at stake in the consumption of food in excess of the supposedly simple nutritional meal and need. While Freud has laid out the primal feast as a scene in which animality is exchanged for human paternity, and Kristeva has indicated the feminine as well as animal territory mapped by the mouth also haunting this feast, it is Derrida that names an ethical imperative addressing that we should eat well. Eating well does not um, equate to fine dining. Rather, the good, underlined by his translator's emphasis on the original uh, bien manger, uh, speaks to an ethics that for Derrida cannot be resolved into a formula. Sarah Gaia notes that un homme de bien is not merely a good man, but a man of property, and that bien is connected to the Greek oikos. Drawing together, she says, the home, the proper, the private, the love and affection of one's kin. Not only are we always in a relation of eating the other and being eaten by them, but the ingestion, the verb indicates, is limited neither to food nor to intake by mouth. In the Eating Well interview, Derrida himself exclaims, what is eating? Having so expanded this ostensibly self-evident category, now repose as the metonymy of introjection. Right, so what is in proximity to that which is taken in? Contiguous with eating, introjection names the psychic processes of identification and itself metonymizes the work of the psychoanalyst Abraham Torok, on whom Derrida implicitly draws, albeit in a modified way. For Freud, Abraham, Torok, and Derrida, we must eat the other if we are to form our own ego. That is to say, our earliest identifications with others occur as a form of ingestion that we are obliged to swallow. For Derrida, the must here refers to an ethics of infinite hospitality. One takes in the other, but does not, cannot decide which other. At the same time, there is this cannot in that, in that we cannot measure or decide how much of that other to take in. <clears throat> the critical interface of literal and figural ensure that we cannot totally appropriate the other through this ingestion. That the ostensibly physical practice of eating and ostensibly psychical process of introjection may be, shed to, may be said to share a border not only points to the difficulty of forming a clear succession or separation between literal and figural, but also between need and desire, and thus for Derrida, if not for Abraham and Torok, between humans and other animals. This is one of the things that really interests me in, in the literature, because while there is a certain critical fixation and, and fascination with the work of Abraham and Torok and their work on the crypt, um, which I'll, I will come to, um, it, it remains kind of fascinated with the kind of architecture of the crypt and of secreting away the other for, for whom one fails to mourn um, and doesn't really get into the ways that I think that there are, uh, there are differences between um, deconstruction and psychoanalysis 
which are very interesting for me in terms of the way that they shift relationships between humans and other animals rather than drawing the line. Departing from the metaphysical conceptual path that orders and interludes uh, these terms leads Derrida to pose the ethics of the one must eat well as offering infinite hospitality. This infinite hospitality strikes at what he calls the carno phalogocentric heart of metaphysics in calling into question the structure of sacrifice that it conserves. This mouthful of a term brings his existing critique of the conceit unifying the presence of the word with that of the phallus, phalogocentrism, into contact with a carnivorous appetite. Even thinkers with whom Derrida shares ground, such as Emmanuel Levinas, fall foul of the configuration of sacrifice. While a command such as Levinas' is um, well known, thou shalt not kill, may be invoked, even as first principle. Derrida draws attention to the way in which killing is managed, such that what he calls a non-criminal putting to death symbolically and legally distinct from murder is reserved for some beings. This Levinasian ethical law, thou shalt not kill, implicitly addresses a human community for whom the killing of non-humans does not count. It's explicitly affecting animals. The sacrificial loophole for legal killing can and has been turned on humans, frequently figured animalistically as vermin, for example. As Freud describes, so Derrida critiques this, this community, which moreover privileges brotherhood. The virility associated with the carno phalogocentric subject is, as Derrida says, that of the adult male, the father, the husband, or brother demanding a sacrifice. Rather than legislate anew, invoking a new law on which we could always rely. The ethics of infinite hospitality keep the question of what it is to eat well open. Refusing to sequester symbolic anthropophagy, cannibalism, as a human practice distinct from literal cannibalism committed by the untutored by animals, those who lack the law. Derrida implies that vegetarians also eat meat in the place where eating and introjection touch. Harking back to my remarks on early identification as a form of eating the other, there is a metaphoric carnivory at stake that is not definitively refused by the practice of a vegetarian diet. This metaphoric ingestion is not necessarily organized linguistically, um, i.e. it's not clear for Derrida, metaphoric carnivory as part of a practice of identification is not performed by non-human species, i.e. it might be. The, con the contiguity between eating and identification provokes another conceptually challenging question. In what respect, Derrida asks, does the formulation of these questions in language give us still more food for thought? In what respect is the question still carnivorous? End quote. The carnivory of the question is given with a caveat, formulation, in language. The question recalls the Freudian understanding of language acquisition as the substitution of breast for word. In the crossover between the metaphysics of presence and psychoanalysis, a suite of metonymies, milk, breast, mother, all bound to the analytic fantasy of satisfaction, give way to the substitution of language. The question further opens towards what Derrida will call a limit trophic subject, one whose borders grow, change, for whom no orifice is immune to the ingestion of the other. Where Levinas poses the face, and the encounter of the face to face, as that which says, thou shalt not kill. Derrida displaces the humanism that the face proposes with all the orifices, thus weakening the association with liter literally speaking subjects. In Abraham and Torok's work on mourning, framed in binary combat as mourning or melancholia, introjection versus incorporation, 
they distinguish these processes in ways that lend themselves to thinking about Fisk, go back to the film, to the thinking about Fisk's abrupt dismissal of pain. In Derrida's foreword for Abraham and Torok's book, The Wolfman's Magic Word, he warns against the limitations of a linguisticistic reading of their work, which is one very easy to make, since it stems from the very base of their enterprise. This reading overdetermines the mouth as the privileged oral locus of verbal language, one whose presence fills the gap left by the breast. Speech comes first and speech is presence, the metaphysical problem inherited by psychoanalysis. Derrida underlines the inadvertent fracture in this logic. The substitution is partial, presence is a figure of presence. Psychic life is in mourning from the start. Abraham and Torok differentiate mourning and melancholia through two different relations to the literal and the metaphoric. This is the most complicated bit. It gets easier after this, I swear. Rather than interject the lost other as a metaphor, the melancholic incorporates that lost other as an object that thus refuses metaphoricity. Melancholic incorporation involves the fantasy that one eats this object, this lost object, not to interject it, in order to vomit it in a way into the inside, into the pocket of a cyst. That weird phrasing is Derrida's of this vomiting away of the other that one refuses to mourn or refuses to acknowledge that one refuses to mourn. This cyst is the secret crypt in Abraham and Torok's terms into which the one for whom the melancholic fails to mourn is tucked away. Secret. Abraham and Torah oppose the withheld path of incorporation to the sociality of introjection. For them, introjecting, this is quite a quote, introjecting a desire, a pain, a situation, means channeling them through language into a communion of empty mouths, end quote. So empty mouths, empty by virtue, of the, the loss of the breast, the process of weaning. As Derrida writes, introjection speaks, incorporation keeps still, speaks only to silence or to ward off intruders from its secret place. This crypt of language depends, for Derrida, on the, on the logic of a primary substitution for the maternal breast configured as presence. Language, cryptic or otherwise, is here caught in the logic of representation. Of course, Derrida gives emphasis to the supplemental nature of the substitution of breast by word. Supplemented, the breast loses the sense of an originary completion without thereby falling into a logic of lack. Rather than the full presence of the breast, metonym of the mother's body, metonym of nature, Derrida posits an original writing general hieroglyphia preceding possibility for thinking the crypt. Now ingestion that does not necessarily pass by way of the mouth immediately evokes the nose for Dean Spanley as well as the ears for his audience while the crisis in language summons fists. words by indulging their figural capacities, nor worries about offence. The congregated guests around the dinner table in the climactic sequence are at first beholden to his stories, ones they have not come to hear. We hear how his late wife dragged him from Balzac to aid their two sons out on a rowboat on the stormy lake. Mocking her fears, the cantankerous Fisk addressed the storm, intoning, give up your dead as if they were already deceased. This disregard for emotional response evidently predates the death of his son, Harrington. Fighting in the Boer War, his body was never recovered. At dinner, once the Dean has again become the focus of attention, we learn the incorporative extent to which Wag and Harrington share the same fate, 
both marked by what Derrida calls a non-criminal putting to death. Take this in the drawing room. Good mind, sir. Uh, I should prefer to remain here to enjoy my good kind. Uh, and why is that? I, I cannot really say. I, sometimes you get comfortable where you are. You don't want to disturb yourself. Poppycock. Fortune taken in the drawing room. Let the ladies get on with whatever it is they get on with. I'm not lady. In one smell. What is the fellow on about? There's a patch of ground out behind the shed where the earth is always moist, and I love to know where to get a particular aura around me. It brought out the natural secretion, so I wonder if it was a glow. sound convey so many meanings. There was a wag which meant a walk. There was a wag which meant go away from the table. And there was a wag which meant you are to be bathed from all the wags. That wag is the most terrible. Why is that? Because through all his great wisdom, he never understood how embarrassing it is to meet another dog when one isn't wearing one's own smell. But more importantly, they did not know who you were. So you had to go through all that business of circling and sniffing and growling. And I was always being embarrassed in that way with a particular friend of mine. What to do? You have to fight. Oh, we fought a few times just to get acquainted. That I enjoyed. My favorite grip was the ear. You always hear how going for the throat is uh, the best approach, but in my experience, it's almost impossible. So I will always go for the year. But it does give the opportunity for excellent complaint. My friend had a very good complaint, which I memorized, and I would use by having to take a beating from the master. He beat you? Oh, really? On certain occasions. It was quite poor. Certainly. Then I would use this splendid complaint, which I learned from my friend. So what was his name? This friend of yours? His name. I don't think I knew the name this master called me. Indeed, I'm not entirely sure he had a master, but his complaint was most satisfying. Oh, rescue me, I'm a poor, unfortunate creature, far from home, and without a friend. Help me, help me. I have fallen into terrible straits. and I'm about to be murdered. Which, of course, was not the case. This dog, the one without the master, uh, what sort of dog was he? Oh, the best of fellows. Adventurous and carefree, fearless, bold. But you said he was whining and sniveling about being murdered. Oh, that was just his complaint. As you made him, his friend. He would leave messages on the cart that brought the milk.
So it is the Dean's desire to remain at the table that again prompts this olfactory metaphor, spurring his uncanny reflections. Leaving the table would be equivalent to having a bath when one had just gotten comfortable in one's smell. Bodily, animal smell is thus brought into proximity with the bouquet of Takai as a form of clothing, troubling its primary horizontality in Freudian legend. Bathing, cleanliness, leads to the embarrassment of nudity. The seance-like scene in the dark environment of the book-lined room housing the dinner resumes. Or in Derrida's neologism, the animal seance resumes. Leonard Lawler unpacks this term as both animated impropriety and as a session of the animal. Session having both a psychoanalytic and an occult implication. Fisk is astonished. Before he can issue an insult, the dean resumes his otherworldly discourse. Speaking from the twinned crypt of Harrington and Wag, he makes casual reference to being called Wag by the master. The dean's ensuing stories entrance Fisk even more than Henslow, and in transferential style, he soon responds as the master in question even recognizing himself as the one who administered an occasional beating. The tales to which Fisk is party bring the whole group together. Here we gain a clearer picture of urination as writing practice, <coughs> of the enticing smell of fear, and of friendship between dogs, the unmastered, unnamed stranger, and wag domesticated, his species loyalty divided by love of a master. The picture is fleshed out by luscious flashbacks, cinematically coded as first-person memory, in that they are attached through successive sequencing to the Dean, but shot from a low angle, from a dog's eye view. The latter gives credence to the Dean's story and draws those who see these sequences, the cinematic audience, into the film through that canine viewpoint, making dogs of us all. Exuberant dogs, often taking up the whole frame, dogs in the prime of life, sometimes with a slightly self-consciously comedic feel produced through a slow-motion close-up of wind in their coats, all suggesting that, yes, those times were fantastic. This is particularly taken with the Dean's assurance that to find home after running unfettered through farmland with his pal, he need only turn toward it. This confidence mystifies Fisk since Wag, the pet dog, had disappeared, like Harrington, his son, and no body had been recovered. Yet the dogs do not arrive home, since, as the film shows, just after this clip, while the Dean cannot tell, a farmer shoots them dead. As Fisk stares at the Dean, the scene cuts back to that same field in that same light, this time with the son, Harrington, riding a horse across it. With the sound of gunshot, the scene cuts, and we see Harrington lying dead in the field as the Dean narrates Wag's last thoughts of home in his heart and the master waiting. No, no pain. The Dean's audience are visibly affected, and indeed it would be hard to remain unmoved. Fisk, now weeping, touches the Dean's hand affectionately. With new consideration for the feelings of others, Fisk retires saying that he is put in memory of Harrington, the son whose name he uses for the first time in the film. Finding him crying in the hallway, the surprised housekeeper asks Fisk if he is all right. He was shot, he replies, showing his pain and opening the crypt. The personal pronoun is ambivalent as to which death it refers, Harrington or Wag, both shot, the dog as an animal trespassing on a farmer's land and as an animal that can be killed without criminal offence, indeed without truly dying, merely perishing, according to Heidegger. The son as a soldier engaged in the lawful practice of killing those designated enemy is himself so killed, a casualty of war. The Dean's apparent recollection gives a representation to the traumatic absence of any such for Fisk and one that affirms no pain. In contrast to the formerly inexplicable disappearances of Harrington and Wag, Mrs. Fisk died of grief for her son in emotional pain enough for both of us, 
in Fisk's encrypted opinion. Yet the film shows no engagement with Fisk's grief for his wife, who remains nameless, only his belated double mourning for son and dog. Eating wag as metaphor by taking in the Dean's narration allows the name of Harrington and sociality to surface. Talking now with uncharacteristic familiarity, Fisk hugs Henslow, calls him too by name, and volunteers to see him on any day of the week. One moment you are running along, the next you are no more, a tearful Fisk utters, the pronoun again lending ambivalence to its reference. Substitutable, the second person could indicate Henslow, Harrington, Wag, Fisk himself, or any other. With the animal cure pronounced and Fisk returned to sociality and or as paternity, fascination with the Dean fades. This father too has been figuratively consumed. Henslow next finds his father, not ensconced in the parlor, but outside playing with a spaniel. A dog has replaced the Dean. A dog comes home and home is reestablished. Watching Henslow, watching his father, the film frames Mrs. Brimley, the housekeeper, next to the painted portrait of Mrs. Fisk. Mrs. Fisk, nominally the maternal figure in the film, is never mentioned in Fisk's restored sense of feeling, but is nevertheless symbolically assembled through this representation with the group approving Fisk's joy in the new pet. In the spirit of doubles dogging this film, Mrs. Brimley metonymizes the maternal, but a maternal already in service to the father to the law. Employed as housekeeper, she literally maintains clean borders rather than, their, rather than threaten their collapse in Christavan objection. Later in the film, talking to her late husband in the form of a chair, the chair in which he used to sit, Mrs. Brimley refuses, refutes the idea that she would ever cook anything so disgusting as a whole rabbit. Is the new spaniel a substitute for Wag or Harrington? Maintaining totemic ambivalence of whether humans and animals are distinct or consanguineous, Henslow's closing voiceover suggests that reincarnation might be something to greet with anticipation. And that should he be reborn as a dog, he hopes to belong to as a master as kind as his father. Given that Fisk had affirmed that he beat Wag, only when it was necessary. And the Dean had spouted the colonialist view requiring the colonized to love their colonizing masters, characteristically confusing servant with dog. This wish too remains thoroughly ambivalent. What is clear, however, is that not any animal could induce this cure for Fisk. I've indicated that the animal in the Dean is domesticated rather than wild, indexing Fisk rather than unleashed animal others. The film also deliberately repudiates femininity. The Dean reviles cats, berating their lack of understanding of the sport of the chase, and Swami Prash specifically expels them from proximity to man early in the film. Speaking of reincarnation, at the event that first brings the protagonists together, the Swami vehemently rejects inquiries after a feline soul made by women in the audience. In spite of its scenes of hospitality, Dean's family does not welcome animality, rather its feminine taint and concomitant disrespect for the law of the master is held at bay, while the film maintains a domesticated totemism commanding masculine descent. Derrida asks, what would happen to fraternity should an animal or a sister into the scene. So the animal is in the animal, therefore I am the inquiry about the possibility of the sister is in politics of friendship. Dean's family splits between negative and affirmative readings. The symptomatic containment of the animal precisely as man's best friend, absorbing the dog within the discourse of friendship and ingenious pointers to deconstructing the conceptual hierarchy of man and animal. Last section, just desserts. So I began with 
with that quotation that I didn't want to read out in, in entirety about um, Derrida asking, are we capable of mourning? So, are we capable of true mourning? The phrasing resonates with his deconstruction of the habitual framing of human response versus animal reaction. In the animal that therefore I am, rather than simply extend the ability to respond to animals, Derrida questions the way in which ability is construed as the proper of the human, the ability to speak, respond, reason, etc., and proposes a weak ability in the common question, can they suffer, i.e., are they able to suffer? Here he asks, do we have the ability to mourn? His implication troubles the binary confidently asserted as mourning or melancholia by Abraham Torok, a division that circulates the one for whom we successfully mourn and encrypts the one for whom we fail to do so. Getting at the leeway in Dean Spanley to go beyond a beguiling human narrative in which dogs feature decoratively has demanded a critical engagement with the crime that founds culture in Freudian legend, the primal feast. The sexism of that feast required the addition of Esteva. The human exceptionalism of psychoanalysis as linked to the metaphysics of, pre of presence brought Derrida into the scene. At numerous uh, points, I have drawn on Derrida's deconstruction of the classical methods of distinguishing man from animal to affirm ways in which this film departs from those methods. Writing is, is habitually thought as the communicative medium of the human, the film invites us to think of dogs as beings who also write. For the dean, for the dean, scent is a form of clothing with which animals, like humans, also hide themselves. The film also modifies the cinematic convention of the point of view shot to sympathetically and plausibly <coughs> draw us into a canine environment. However, the film also employs a masculinist ruse that risks fettering its departures from the discourse on the animal. When scholars are pulled back from writing with urine, this is at the hands of a female figure whose action is tantamount to toilet training. Elements that might usually impart abject revulsion, sniffing urine, eating entire rabbits, and thus bespeak the defilement of Christaven abjection, are elevated to ritual events. In so doing, the film risks maintaining a virility in which man's best friend is indeed like man, rather than following through on Derrida's insight that the general condition of writing affects the living in general and cannot secure impermeable, impermeable borders, including borders between species. Ending on the son's desire for a good father who will treat him, even discipline him, like a pet dog, endorse his classically satisfying narrative closure. Our inability to decide how and when we eat the other nurtures resistance to such ends. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. That was really good. Um, has anybody got any quite questions they want to ask? That's a question. You know, you just mentioned um, the film Capetra was subverted through a, a canine um, viewpoint. viewpoint. Do you mean in, in a kind of formal sense of how it was filmed? And, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I did want to show more clips, but I was having such adventures with ma massive megabytes. Um, that, that I didn't do it. <laughs> but there, there's lovely other moments when, it, when everything is, is shot, including the scene of, of um, downing an entire rabbit. On this. So does, does this happen gradually throughout the film? Because it reminds me of um, uh, um, that director, the guy that did Queen, uh, um, Queen Elizabeth, um, at the end of the film, the camera base gets lower and lower and lower, the more power she sort yes. of gains. So it, does it happen gradually or is it in? Well, uh, uh, no, at first you, you have to take the Dean's word for it, so you just hear the story, and it's merely his behaviour. And he's, I mean, I, I usually really dislike Sam Neill as an actor, right. but here I, I think he's amazing. And, and, and the, the, just the, the, the movement on his face when he's paying just too much attention to that smell is all you kind of have to go on. And then there's these 
from stories where he just seems to be in another world. But then the next time you get the cut, you, you get it from the dog's eye view, with the, you know, the lovely lighting and, and the great weather and the, and the wind in the coats. <laughs> so yeah, it kind of is dog's eye view, but it's also very romantic. It's like Hollywood dog's eye view by way of New Zealand. It's New Zealand. So, I appreciate that it's um, pretty intense material. <laughs> well, you, you go. Right. <clears throat> um, I was just going to ask, do you think Fisk was uh, reluctant to enter into some form of economy because the mourning is some form of labour. So he was kind of holding back from entering into this debt. In a sense, although I, I, I noticed, and um, I've been modifying this um, prior to the um, article's publication, I, I was, one, one of my ambivalences about the film was the way in which there is so much exchange between the dog and the son at the end. But in, in reading through it and thinking about it this, this last time, for the end time, <laughs> I, I, I noticed that moment where um, um, Fisk is, is, is narrating, berating his wife for being afraid about their sons out on the lake. So I thought, okay, you were already a miserable codger. Um, you know, when your sons were both alive and well, you were already refusing emotion. So in the, within the film's narrative, that then narrates his pain uh, in primary association with the lost dog, with the body of the lost dog, you know, and, and there being no representation, no story, no end mm. to why the dog hadn't come back. So it puts his refusal to engage um, with a social world to that point. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, the reader's view on vegetarians? What was he saying about eating flesh? Yeah. Um, I notice, and I've been working on this recently, how while, while there is um, a degree of irritation um, with Derrida in the kind of um, abolitionist, vegan kind of end of animal studies, if there is also still respect and like you know, the big philosopher has spoken, and this has been you know strategically very useful. Even though Johnny Come Lately is now getting all of the attention, and we've been doing this one for years, and he's not vegetarian. Um, as compared to um, Donna Haraway, who I, I, I know through um, personal contacts has been vegetarian sometimes and not at others, but she's also um, presents what I think is a very is, is a critique that is hosp utterly hospitable to the kind of material that Derrida sets out. But she really, really gets it in the neck. People loathe Donna Haraway, um, who are associated with um, animal advocacy, abolitionism, uh, liberation, um, because she, she will not um, draw the line that says, you know, no animal must ever be eaten, um, no animal must ever be in the lab which is much more difficult to, to kind of maintain, but she's a whole kind of uh, area of thinking around shared suffering, which is very interesting. Um, it's very clear, um, and there is, is absolutely explicit that we're in a world crisis, and that, you know, we are you know, breeding animals, not you know, to be eaten, to be used as in clothing, in furniture, in toothpaste, <laughs> that's whatever it is in medicine. Um, at an ever escalating rate, um, at an obscene rate, and he's clearly, you know, absolutely critical of this massive explosion. Um, it's, it's ever, uh, you know, it seems to be just completely escalating, um, and the way in, in which that that usage, um, that appropriation of you know of the, the body of animal others, um, has its philosophical kind of foundation in this absolute divide. You know, we are humans, they are animals, and if you happen to actually be human but we want to exterminate you, we'll call you animals. You know, it is the violence of the animalizing trope. But he does not legislate for a vegetarian solution, which I think is also interesting. So he, he doesn't, he will, he will never um, uh, 
<coughs> uh, rights or um, you know, we never affirmed um, uh, a program, a formula that would say, okay, you know, this is the problem and here's the solution. And I would take my solution and I would apply it here and I would apply it there and there and, oh, you have a problem? Here's my solution. So it, it would never be the same um, response because that would, you know, deny the particularity of the event. Uh, it, would, it would refuse justice. You know, we do not know what the situation would be, who will be faced with, with, with what ethical relation um, we will be kind of brought into uh, encounter with. Um, there's so much to say here. Um, there's also a, there's a lot of work being done now in terms of um, rethinking the kind of multi-species uh, ecologies that we are. So that you know, I'm not simply human being. In fact, very little of me is probably human being. We look at me genetically, molecularly. It's the bacteria that live all the way through me that sustain me. Um, and I know that again, um, those people who maintain the the calculation of animal, animal rights that, that do um, mobilise abolition, uh, abolitionism as, as a solution are really infuriated by people giving time to the question of how bacteria exist and, and, that, and, and entertaining that as, a, as interesting at all. And that there's a fabulous um, and fuckingly young scholar called Michael Marder who is doing a lot of work on plants. He's, He's written one book on something like plant living, and it's got a whole trilogy coming out of Columbia um, that draws on a kind of Levinasian, Derridean kind of ethical um, kind of framework to really think through um, plant life. And he's very, you know, absolutely engaged with the science. Um, and there's an interview with him on Columbia's uh, webpage with a leading uh, vegan activist lawyer, Gary Francioni. And they are head to head. And Francioni is basically saying, you know, you are, you're diluting the cause. You're, you're taking attention away. You know, you people always want to start talking about plants. That's not the issue. I am never in an ethical relationship with a plant. This will never happen. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, yes, I, I, I do understand that there is world urgency. The, you know, methane emissions from cows are, you know, like worse than, than you know, um, than, um, Fumes emitted from cars, mm -hmm. and, the, you know, and the volume of cows being eaten uh, now at farmed and eaten is just horrific. Um, but then I also think that there are massive ethical issues that we face with plants. Soy being the most obvious example, you know, the kind of Monsanto's GMO patented soy pretty much taking over the economy mm -hmm. of Argentina, and that that soy is not being grown for for vegetarians which is the, the really cruel irony, it's being grown as animal feed <laughs> for the cows that never see grass, they're just being fed like soy or corn. So there are huge vegetal economies in which we are deeply embedded in ethical relations. I mean, the wearing of cotton, um, and I never thought about cotton as being so ethically fraught, um, but if it's not organic, then you're looking at a field that's been you know, pesticided uh, I mean, he's extremely interested in, in the use of, of pesticides because obviously the you know, decimation of food population is a key part of the food chain mm -hmm. on which life depends, um, or which is poisoning them out of existence um, and denying it. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that was a hugely um, uh, kind of constellated response. Um, I hope that some of that is useful. I could probably say give lots of other um, I mean, constellations the best word there because it doesn't come down to a yes no for Derrida, okay, whereas it is if you are vegan abolitionist, it's an absolutely clear yes no. Um, I, am, I, I do eat meat, although I am actually eating less meat um, and, and trying to increase, increase up my and our vegetarian repertoire. Um, so it, you know, it's a daily issue in in the supermarket, in in the school, yeah, and you know, in what's available. It's a conversation that is kind of perpetually there. Um, yes, um, I'd like to circle back to the melancholia question, and also the questions around literally the so-called animal cure 
this relationship of what it means to say cure, and that the moment of cure isn't the speaking cure, it's not the visual cure, it's the smelling cure, as it were. Well, the, obviously speaking and smell, as opposed to speaking and sight, come together. And it seems that that issue for me, upon hearing this today, uh, this, this twin-sided thing, on the one hand, it seems to me that there's a question to be asked about primal melancholy, or primal mourning. Is there like one main thing that happens to a human being that becomes the primal scene of the morning? And then other things can happen along the way, but they don't quite count as much. Or can you have a kind of series of things that are more mourningful? And that, so the work of mourning is never done in part because killing, death, horribleness is never finished. So, so on the one hand, there seems to be a primal mourning that happens with it, in this case with his pet. Um, and on the other hand is the question of this animal cure. The, the animal cure names something that doesn't have representation as its primary feature. And I find that interesting. And I'm wondering whether or not it has to be an animal that enacts the animal cure, or if in fact it's actually the smell that enacts, the, 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 the way in which the smell becomes a privileged uh, way in to understand pleasure, to, to reset the, the thing so you can come back to pleasure, come back to uh, sensuality that has been sort of hived off uh, once the primal morning scenario kicks in. So there, it's a double, I hope it's not too, too... I think you've got probably got three things in there. Okay. But, but, well, one is within, within um, the paper, um, the animal cure is attached to representation, and I identify that as a problem. Yeah. Because in a, in a sense, it, it's, it's text. It, it happens to have animals in it, in a sense. You, you could, you could, I think you could probably um, go here entirely in the land of animal allegory and not kind of push. Not come across an animal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and kind of push the, the kind of de deconstruction of, of human-animal um, division in the way that I've tried to do. Um, I think that the, you know, the, the scene at the dinner table is kind of classically representational. Here is the story that was missing. You know, you suffer because you know your loss was never represented. And here I, I give you the representation, and I tell you that there was no pain as well. <laughs> so, so, so it's okay. In in a sense, um, that, that well, whilst being you know, you know, pleasurable to engage with. Um, you know, aesthetically it's done really nicely, um, it's acted really brilliantly, it's really touching, um, but it is also very classically representational and very classically psychoanalytic. Um, all, all of the places where it might go otherwise don't actually happen. There are all the places that are kind of, kind of pushing at, at um, you know, what are fairly embedded, and, and, and Derrida's work on Abraham and Torok is really very, very dense, and it's, it's not clear that his introduction to their work is actually a critical introduction. <laughs> um, and I, 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 in the literature, I haven't found anybody else um, positioning his work as, as, as different from theirs, mm. um, in, in a way, in, in the major way that I actually think it is, in expanding um, the, the question of identification through all of the orifices of the body that need not privilege the mouth, that need not privilege language, that might also include other animals, the implication that it, that it, it, that it does, mm. that dispenses with the hierarchy of the signifier. Um, so the animal cure in that context for you, not for Dean's family, yeah. but for you, embraces orality in the fullest sense of the ability to place it anywhere on on a sensuous visceral plane of the body. Yes. So the you know the ear, the nose, the mouth, the yeah. eye. Genitals. Genitals, Genitals obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that I think is 
kind of amazing that yeah. that's an interesting move I hadn't noticed that before. And okay, so then how do you then deal with the question of multiple uh, sadnesses? You know, like because it, always in Freud, there's always the <coughs> the problem. You haven't gotten over your mother. You haven't gotten over your father. Whatever the issue is, that, that kind of thing. And it's usually either the mother or the father. Yeah. That's the that's the problem. And then you either then you either I don't know. Eureka, get over it, or you don't. And so and it sounds to me that there's a cure that's being offered to the primal melancholy, which happens as a child. Um, do you, as a, as a philosopher in, and you, mm -hmm. you, a Druidian philosopher here, would you say that there's a primal melancholy or that there, uh, to which there could be a cure? Uh, or is what? It, this is it. <laughs> However, um, I'm asking it on. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, okay. no. Uh, psychoanalysis, yes. Um, deconstruction, only kind of. <laughs> so I think um, because you, yeah. I mean, I and I've, I've yet to really work through. Um, um, the logics, and again, I, I can't think of anybody else who does so, the ways in which um, um, Derrida is interested in um, logics of loss that do not congeal into a grand narrative of lack. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that speaks to what to, to yeah. your question. Because um, you're right, in psychoanalysis, there's always a grand cut. I mean, it's the, the, the grand cut of sexual difference, the grand cut of, being, of losing the body and gaining the signifier that is just being reworked here. Um, very interesting. It, I think suggestively, because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's room for maneuver for, for, for new writings that we can do work on this. And I'm really interested in, in ways that. Um, uh, other species right. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, which isn't to say that other species write Tolstoy, which is you know, the kind of usual thing. They haven't written the War and Peace. <laughs> so <laughs> obviously they don't write. It's like, this, this is you know, a belittling of the question. Um, hmm. Yes, I don't know whether I could, I could be no, that, that, in, illuminating. Thanks, that, that was I thought that was interesting though, because at least it opens up the possibility for the plurality of loss, which yes. marks certainly 21st century, if not any other time period, time period, and at the same time opens up the possibility of ways of handling it without reverting to a lack. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's actually quite yeah. interesting. I mean, and, it, and it does also somehow, you know, congeal again around the fantasy of the mother, uh, you know, fantasy of the mother, fantasy of nature yeah. as originally present. Yeah. Uh, you know, and fulsome and you know satisfying um, psychoanalysis. But again, Derrida will interrupt that lo that logic, um, you know, that fantasy of completion and totality. It's okay, um, and say that you know, you know the mother is always supplementary or something. So th there's always some interruption of that logic without then making the mother always already castrated. Or something. Yeah. There's a there's a it's not an opposition because that's too frontal. There's, there's a shift away from the great drama of the, you know, the, the total lack, lack or foul. Um, and isn't that then the animal cure? Yes, I, yes, yes. I think that that, that, yes. that strikes me as that's why it's called the animal cure. Well, that, that would mean, I, yeah, I might actually we think that. You might have to borrow it. I might have to <laughs> You um, already get my Are there any other questions? Well, we're going to all reassemble at bar one, and uh, you are all welcome to ask uh, uh, Lynn any question that you might have for her. So, thank you.